uh, the, the team will be talking about the Ghana IMF relationship. Exactly. You, you had the president talking about the fact that we're not going to extend the program mm. after it ends, uh, hopefully later this year. Yeah, and so also... So OPN will be in the house, mm. and it's a year since Ex the collapse of UT Capital and, Capital and UT Bank. Bank. Yeah. We'll bring you a human side to that story, hopefully, yeah. in this bulletin. But let's uh, begin with uh, something that is still happening in the banking sector. Some local banks are said to be under pressure as a result of the current challenges facing the sector. Sources say this has resulted in panic withdrawals from these institutions, but is the situation getting out of hand or something can be done immediately to reverse the trend? We have more in this report. For some of these local banks, a day would not pass without a customer making inquiries on their investments or accounts. Speaking to some of these banks, they say their position has been worsened by the recent collapse of the five banks, all of which are local financial institutions. According to them, this has given the impression that all the local banks are not in good position or, let's say, not healthy. However, this has been rejected by some of these local banks, especially those in good standing, who have been arguing that their financial statements for last year and even half the year should demonstrate that they are not in distress and are indeed abiding by by good corporate governance practices. One individual that can be described as, quote, a high net worth client, and quote, for instance, has told Joy Business because of the current happenings, he has closed his accounts with about three local banks and moved it to one of the big foreign banks in the country. Sources say government decision to move its account held with the commercial banks to the central bank has also complicated issues for the local banks that were depending heavily on these deposits for the operations. We also understand that one of the biggest local banks in the country recently had to rely on Bank of Ghana for some emergency liquidity support of it to stay alive. Checks with the central bank show that out of the 30 commercial banks that are in operation, 13 are local banks. Well, banking consultant and lecturer at the Ghana Banking College, Dr. Rich Monitiahene, has indicated that government policies and programs targeted at the private sector will face a huge setback as a result of the happenings in the banking sector. He says the loss of confidence in the banks, especially indigenous-owned ones, will mean that support to the private sector will reduce drastically, leading to the collapse of many businesses. You'll be surprised to hear that credit to private sector declined from 38% to 14%. What it means is that the credit to the private sector has gone down, meaning that the economy which is the, the private sector is the engine, we keep on saying it's the engine. But if it's not getting credit, how can the engine turn? So all these things have ramifications and implications for the whole economy. Not only banks, but about, or even the, go the government policy that one is through one factory. Now, the banks have gone, so who are going to support you? So it has a serious implication for the whole economy. One other implication, very big one that we are, we are, our joy business we are picking up is that it is having effect on banks' deposits, withdrawals, and other, uh, so to speak, panic withdrawals. What would you suggest should be a regulatory response from the central bank or the regulator to this issue? Thank you. I think once all the time, it should be, they should be coming out with assurance assurance. Somebody should say it as the panic is coming in. Somebody should say, don't panic from Bank of Ghana, either the PR department or somebody who would every morning or even appear on some of your programs to assure people that there is no need for panic because government, ha Bank of Ghana has taken the necessary uh, strategy to address the panic. So somebody somewhere needs to be talk, talk as you're speaking about it. Their job is to go to the radio station or TV station and talk and conscientize people that they should not panic because monies, their monies are safe. You're watching Business Live. Now, more banks are pulling resources to meet the December deadline for the 400 million uh, minimum capital requirement. Now, Joy Business has been speaking to the general manager in charge of finance and strategy at Republic Bank, who disclosed the bank will, by September 2018, meet the capitalization requirement. Republic Bank is assuring it will meet its minimum capital requirement of 400 million cities by September this year. The general manager in charge of finance and strategy, Benjamin Joboku, noted that the bank is currently open for strategic acquisitions with some struggling banks which are interested in merging ahead of the December 31st deadline.
that story. We'll bring it back to you in subsequent bulletins. But like you heard me, uh, Sandy and I discuss, is a year after the collapse of UT and Capital Banks, and some former employees are still struggling to make ends meet. Now, several of them have still not received their benefits from the new owners. One of them is an Estina, and my colleague, Justice Bedu has been speaking with her. It's, it's a terrible experience. <laughs> I don't wish this for, for even my worst enemy. If, if you hear these stories, like everything that has brought us to this point where we are bank as to last and we have actually lost our job, being just that, you understand? I mean, you guys outside who are even hearing it now, we are marveled by the kind of revelations you are hearing. Are you trying to say that the regulators or people in high places who manage or regulate the banking sector didn't foresee this at all? Okay, you go out there and you have to mention all the directors of the bank to convince a customer to give you their money. You understand? We sacrificed hoping that things will get better for us to enjoy. You lose your job. You understand? There's stigma all over. Anywhere you go looking for a job and you mention Capital Bank, <laughs> it changes the whole face of the interview. I mean, the whole thing about us, the fact that, hey, you have collapsed the bank and you want to come and collapse our bank. Uh, it's like they joke with it. They they don't see how sensitive that whole experience might have been for the for for the candidates who have come for the interview. We feel deceived. We feel used and dumped. That is how we feel. Used and dumped. Pretty sad, isn't it? Well, you're watching Business Live. We're taking a short break. When we come back, a discussion around Start With Action here in Ghana. Stay with us. Welcome back and you're still watching Business Live and Joy Business can confirm that the Ayensu Starch Factory has shut down and the company owes close to 500 farmers. The defunct company has led to a cassava collapse which is um, driving prices actually down. A ton of cassava that sold last year for 300 cities is now going for 100 cities because cassava meant for the factory cannot be absorbed by the market women. This report was put together by Odilia Ntiamwa, my colleague. Just in the Bodrasi town, we are met by Charles Pado, a farmer of Kasama. He confirms to us that indeed, the Ayensu Starch factory has collapsed. Charles further gives us evidence by bringing a friend's receipt of payments the company is supposed to make. The receipt dates as far back as October 2017. Since then, farmers have not received any money. Charles' brother, Philip, says over 500 farmers are owed money, including himself. They are owing me about 2,000 plus. Mm. And about how many farmers do you think they are owing? They are more than 500. For now, several hectares of cassava planted purposely for the Ayensu Starch Factory is being left in the farms. Last two years, people banked their hope on the Ayensu Starch Factory. So a lot of farmers started growing the cassava. So this year, as the, 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 the factory has closed down, there are a lot of cassava in the farms. So the Gary people, you say, it's a local market. So for them, when they come to the farm, they only buy a few. Let's say, if you have, let's say, 10 acres of the cassava, the Gary people cannot buy all. They only purchase about, let's say, two, three rows. Pricing currently, as a result, is a mess. Cassava last sold at the Ayensu Start Factory at 300 CDs a ton is now 100 CDs, while cassava dough, which went for 80 CDs per bag, is going for 35 Ghana CDs. We are off to Ayensu Start Factory to see things for ourselves. 
there is virtually dead silence at the place. No official is willing to talk on camera, but we are told informally that the company is shut down. Information we gather is that they, however, have snatch in store that needs to be sold. Ghana produces 16 million metric tons of cassava, out of which only 4 million is consumed. The first starch factory under the presidential initiative, which was bought by a private firm, the Ayenso starch factory collapsed, leaves the country with no starch factory now. Cassava production alone forms 22% of the agricultural GDP, and the non-existence of Ayensu only means a huge glut, driving prices so low for farmers. Well, very interesting development, and my colleague Odilia Ntiamwa joins me in studio to talk about this. Odilia, first of all, just describe to us the state of the Ayensu Start Factory. Okay, so I was there last year, mm -hmm. and it was virtually the same issues that we're talking about. At the time, the dryer was totally off. The dryer that is used to dry the um, starch when it goes through the process um, had broken down. Mm -hmm. And what we heard was that they were going to fix a part, and then it would go again but i think after fixing the part the whole machine now just just went down and now they're saying that well it would take them about six to seven months to get this machine what kind back. of course is it that we we have to use six months to, to fix it's amazing or are they not doing maintenance work on these machines before it's it's strange i mean between 2002 when the company was formed up, up until now mm. i don't think that it has lasted so long okay. that a machine should break down so badly mm -hmm. if it was properly maintained. Okay. Um, but of course, it also depends on the lifespan of that particular machine. Mm -hmm. And so what I gather from the management is that they are, they are actually re-engineering the whole machine to fit and suit our environment. Very interesting. But so who owns this company? And why can't we factor this whole thing into the 1D1F program? Okay, so this company is owned 70% by a company called Tiberius, okay, and then also um, government owns um, thirty percent shares. Now, my expectation is that when the one D one F um, whole project started, when I interviewed them last year, I asked them, "Are you going to be put under this project because it looks like you're struggling?" And then the general manager at the time said that, well, they are planning on sending proposals, and I will run you through what actually goes. Yeah, quickly, yeah on when you have to go through the process. So you first um, will send your proposal and then a confirmation is given to you by a phone or by email mm. and then the initial screening and uh, due diligence is done, mm. on-site due diligence is done, they come to your site, mm. then credit assessment is also done, compilation of reports, assessments, committee and contracting and then the disbursement is done. So, so have they done this? They actually haven't gone through the process. What are they the waiting process. for? Why can't they do that? I am not too sure why this company has not uh, been absorbed, especially when government owns 30% exactly. shares. And my expectation is that then they will discuss with um, 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 the 70% share owners and say that, look, why don't you access some of these facilities? Mm. Quickly before we go, I assume that this cassava is not meant for fufu or anything. So Absolutely. what happens to what they have on the farm it's, now? It's unfortunate, but farmers will have to deal with um, post-harvest losses because wow. the cassava is not that kind of crop where you can keep like maize mm. and they cannot also harvest it and go and sell because the women who use it for gari and um, condo are not as many or they do not buy in large quantities right. like the factory would have done. Well, Delia, thanks so much. I think we can go on and I'm just wondering why we have companies collapsing yet. We are talking about creating, new ones. Cre yeah. creating new ones. But yeah. thanks so much for joining us on uh, Business Life too. Now, but we go for OPN today and the conversation is around the relationship between Ghana and the IMF. Make way, make way, make way, hurry, make way, why not hurry? Well, I am, just, I am the IMF and you are so, Ghana, you are Togo, I'm not giving you the way. Why not? Um, because you can't do without me, can you? No, we can. No one, can you tell us something? Well, the IMF has been with Ghana for 61 good years. And in this 61 good years, we've had 16 engagements with them. Wow. Ghana, in our very last program that we are still on, took $980 million for an 
extended credit facility. In May this year, after a review, they agreed to give us a tranche of $191 million. That's a lot so, of money. So what? Okay, so essentially the IMF has one primary goal. Maintaining global stability, global monetary stability, exchange rates and stuff like that. So occasionally, out of their 189 member countries, each of them has a visit from the IMF every year. If you're in a program like Ghana, you don't get a visit every year because they come for, like Novan said, a review. So fine, apart from this, they give us money, 980 million, and they give us capacity building, technical assistance whatsoever. But for the mere fact that we are members of the IMF, there is no way we are going to go without IMF. Let me just put it like that. There is no way, even after this program, they are still going to come down every year to examine our books. And if something is wrong, we'll have to go back in bed with them. Well, so what that really means is that you have a biological father that you can never deny. Exactly. Or oh, let, me, let, me, let me push it. It's like a marriage, 61 year old marriage. And nobody seems to want to get divorced. Ghana wants to get divorced, but there's no way we're going to pull out of the IMF as a member. We are still members of the 189 members of the IMF. So how does what the president said feed into all of this discussion? Okay, so we have to do one thing. We have to keep our books in order. We have to make sure we're doing things right. You understand? So that we don't go back to the IMF. Because once they smell a rat, they're coming down. No, let me just then ask you. Currently, our debt levels are set to be hitting 70%, even a little above that. And that should it be a cause of worry? Okay, so currently, as of May 2018, Bank of Ghana says our debt to GDP ratio is at 68.3%. Now, the threshold is 70%. And you know, with our current borrowings, look at the bank debacle and all that, they expect it to go overboard. Now, when you cross the 70% mark, the IMF and the World Bank came out with what they call the Debt Sustainability Analysis, DSA. So as of June 2018, the Debt Sustainability Analysis report by the IMF and the World Bank showed that Ghana was at high risk of debt stress. When you cross the 70% mark, your debt becomes as sustainable in the sense that your revenues start to you know, go too much into your debt service. And you know we have a problem with raising revenue as a country. And if you're going to be using a lot of your money to be servicing debts, then you have nothing left for capital expenditure, or what we call capex. So yes, debt is an issue. And if we don't keep our economic fundamentals on track in the coming months or years, and the IMF smells a rat, they are going to come down hard on us. My name is Odilia. My name is Philip. And I am Northern. And it's okay. Bye. Bye. Don't All right. miss them. <laughs> I do miss them. That was OPN breaking Ghana and IMF relationship mm. there. But there's just some news coming in Daryl. Yes, uh, news to do with Guta. You know there has been this back and forth about foreigners in our retail space. Well, there's a statement that has come through uh, from Guta. I'd like to read bits of it for you. It says that the Ghana Union of Traders Association wishes to inform all its members and the general public that after extensive engagement and consultation with its members, especially the Swami Magazine branch of the union and the leadership of the Nigerian Traders Association in the Ashanti region, it has been resolved to allow foreigners uh, from particular ECOWAS countries to operate within the Swami Magazine and other designated trading communities in the Ashanti region uh, to open their shops for normal business on Wednesday. From Wednesday, August 15, it has been further resolved between all parties to cooperate and collaborate with the relevant institutions and agencies of state to enforce and ensure full compliance with all laws and regulations governing the activities of trading in Ghana with immediate effect. And so that is the latest. We don't know what changed, but I guess we'll have information in subsequent bulletins. Mm -hmm. That's it for us from us tonight. My name is Daryl Kwa. And my name is Sandra Sinamafeno. Thanks for watching.